Pentecost, the changes that are happening in Pentecost, what it means, especially with graduation Sunday. Uh, you know, the, how are they connected? And last Sunday, I, and I actually was going to start by saying um, I lied. Last Sunday, I said I normally, I never get up here and say, you know, I'm going to give a message to target somebody, you know, because I, I, I'm not that, not that good. Um, but this is graduation Sunday, um, and so this is a little bit more directed than normal. Uh, because oftentimes we think of, of Pentecost as a day on the calendar, you know, something that happened back in Jerusalem, back in those days, and the impact that it had theologically on the church and the, and the mission and, and how Christianity developed and, and, and all of that. We think of it historically, but very rarely do we think of it in the present, um, that this is your Pentecost day, this is your awakening, this is a time for all of us to awaken to what is happening around us. If you remember on that Pentecost story, which we're going to read here in a little bit, people were gathered around when, out of nowhere, the wind just swept in. They, they were unexpected, they were uh, an, unanticipated, but change happened instantly, and it forever changed the way they saw themselves and other people. All of a sudden, instead of Peter being the fisherman, the big fisherman, or John, it became Peter the evangelist. After this point, it was known as John the evangelist. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Gospel of John, it, will, it often refers to it as John the evangelist. It changed their title and their understanding. And I believe now almost for all of us, as well as our graduates, they're almost undergoing an identity shift of monumental change. It's going to change forever how they see themselves. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of, of student ministries, about what we do, the, the concept of, you know, we, we, look, we look forward, what we want them to do is look forward with confidence, right? For all of our graduates to be confident that God is with them and preparing them for what lies ahead, but also because of the firm foundation of what is behind, to, to look back with gratitude. It's that balance of having gratitude for what they have, and of course, we've talked about not it just being entitlement of going, well, of course, you have to do that. And I think all of us have done that at some point when we were growing up. We just expected mom or dad to do our laundry, uh, to cook the meals. We, we, you know, we, that's what their job was. But we get to a place of going, I was born into this place, into these people that watched over me with great care because that's not, that's not given to just anybody. And as a result of that, to be able to, to go to the future looking bold and courageous. Now, that is not just for our graduates, but that's for all of us because we all go through different stages in life. And I'm sorry, but I really couldn't help but going through this by, by pulling out some of the I had over, over the, the past year. Um, Kendall, where's Kendall? What a journey I've seen her go through. Um, she has changed uh, a little bit. Um, she was the one that would always be dressed up. And, and I said, man, she's overcome an awful lot. I mean, every Sunday they would show up in a little different outfit. Um, but she has changed so much. Um, and to see her grow and to see her thrive has just been, just been amazing. Uh, Ryan, they always say it, right? Don't they always say it's, it's the woman behind the throne that makes a, a big difference, right? Because every time you would see Ryan prior to this, every time I would see Ryan, he would be dressed like this. Whenever Tampa would be in town, he would be under the house. He would be up to his waist in muck. Uh, but it seems like uh, a girlfriend, Hala, has really cleaned him up a lot. And I struggled. I actually tried to figure out. I mean, I was looking, do I have any pictures of Hala? Right? Because, but, and I'm like, going, how do you, how do you find pictures of Hala? Well, you look for pictures of Ryan, and then you look what, who's, you know, who's around Ryan. And there's Hala. She has a really nice part, don't you think? <laughs> but wherever Ryan is, Hala's right there, um, bringing out the best in him. Now, this is one of the first pictures that I had uh, when I got here a number of years ago. Um, and this was down at the ball fields. And, and there's a number of kids in there. Um, I don't know if you can see. Uh, there's Ben. 
There's Landon, and I believe that's Ryan right there, okay? Now, I don't know. Take a look at that picture and think back to those times. Do you think Ben has changed at all? Maybe a little. You can't tell what his hair is like under that hat, but there you can see. The other thing I noticed is in the picture, I don't know if they did this intentionally. They kind of put a halo around him. I'm not sure why they did that. But that was a nice touch. I thought that was a nice touch. Landon. Landon, I remember, you know, I remember this picture being taken, um, but I remember going to the Elite Center and watching Landon play basketball. He probably doesn't remember that. And to watch him grow up through the age has just been, and then watch him play football has just been like phenomenal uh, to see this little guy in this picture to grow up to be that guy over there. But we also have a lot of other students that, that, you know, they grow up not only for high school, but we want to celebrate uh, Jackson. Now, how many of you know that, uh, and I got, I got to throw this out there, how many of you know that uh, Marshall won the national championship? All right. Yeah, I watched that too. So we want to celebrate with Jackson. Uh, we also want to celebrate with Alex. Alex graduated from uh, WVU. Now, I have to tell you that I, I, it was just my mind, it was too complicated for me to figure out what they all uh, were majoring and what their majors are. So you can ask the, the families exactly. I know that uh, Alex was in business, finance, or something like that. We also want to celebrate with Madison. Madison graduated from WVU, I think that was last weekend. Was that last weekend? Yeah. We also celebrate with Nate. Nate graduated from WVUP. and with Alec, um, graduated from Fairmont. So we want to celebrate. Here's the point. This is, this is the point of all of this. Um, and, and you're probably hoping that there is a point to all of this. The point is, is that, you know, by taking, taking our students, by taking our, our kids, and, and giving them the values that will guide them to this stage in life, to this jumping off point. Somebody once said that the more choices that you have the more your values matter. The more choices that you have in life, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna be, where you wanna go, the people that you hang out with, the more choices that you have, the more your values will matter. Who should you hang out with? What kind of values matter? And that's why we're talking this morning about Pentecost experience. I wanted, I wanted to share some things with our students and hopefully for all of you to listen in because it's critical and I really do think that we live in an unprecedented time, almost a time of equal significance to, Guten, uh, to Gutenberg's Bible, but also to the, to the uh, creation of the printing press. Things are changing so rapidly, so fundamentally, that our values are more important now than at any other time. And we need to understand and value our children's ministry, give them the tools to navigate these uncertain times. Because here's what's important to, to understand about Pentecost. At Pentecost, it was both unexpected. There are changes that are happening that were totally outside their ability to, to predict. It was life-altering. What was before is different than what is after. And it was uncontrollable. Oftentimes, we get very nervous about trying to control our environment, trying to manipulate what we're going to do. We, we can't even control our health. We can't even control what's going on in our own lives. Things are all the time. If there's anything that 2020 should have taught, taught us is the limits of our control. And so we come to this Pentecost moment and understand that perhaps God is doing a new thing in your life. So if you ever have those moments where you kind of say, things happen to me that are un unexpected, unpredictable, they come and they are life altering. They've changed the way I see myself and see those that are around me. Then you are actually having a Pentecost moment. And for us, it is the birth of the church, it's the birth of, of who we are as a people, and how we understand life as it's unfolding around us. So this morning, I wanted to read from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It's the story of Pentecost, but it's also from the message translation, and so it comes across a little bit different, and I like the way, the, like the way it unfolds. Now, when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, a gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the whole 
the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard one after another in their own tongue being spoken, they were blown away. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Crete, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, both Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our language, describing God, and they couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? But others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. This is the word of God for the people of God. So when was the last time you can say that you had a Pentecost experience? A time that you can say that my life before that is radically different than my life after that. Isn't it a sad state of affairs if we sit in the church week after week and say, I don't remember the last time. I felt the spirit move. And so the question for all of us is, what does it take for us to invite the spirit to overwhelm us, to to bring down our guard just a little bit and allow the spirit to speak to us? But let me ask you first, how do you describe your experience with God? Do you experience it in the Bible? It's often talked about the, the, the spirit coming to us as a dove, gentle as a dove, As Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened, and gentle as the dove, the Spirit rested upon him, and people perceived it as a dove, which is great. So why is it in this moment, as Pentecost comes, it doesn't come as little doves over everyone's head, but it comes as fire? What what is the imagery that it's trying to portray? Well, Fire is a consuming fire. It it is something that both warms and enlightens, but also burns away, but also consumes, and is all-powerful. The the difference between this attitude, between whether you accept God as a gentle dove, a God that can be uh, controlled and is light and is predictable, or whether it is a consuming fire that is a little bit outside of your control. What is it that you experience when you think about the presence of God in your life? Oftentimes when people think of Pentecost, we think of it in terms of being anxious and fearful and therefore withdrawn. And so when I talk about the graduates, about this transition they're making into a a different level of independence, oftentimes that level comes with a certain amount of anxiety. What is God asking of me? What what will the future hold? I, I remember my first couple of semesters in college were incredibly uh, filled with anxiety and fear. Going from a small high school um, to a, a large university, I felt lost and alone. And there was that anxiety, and with that anxiety came a sense of being withdrawn and becoming much more fearful. But whenever we have in our corner a God that is going to walk with us and say, I will be with you through this, it changes how you view yourself and the life that you have been given. All of us love to fall into the rut that other people create for us. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are you responding to the witness of Pentecost in your life? So here's what I want you to get across. It is better to catch fire for something than to grow cold for nothing. It's better to catch fire for what God has in plan, the the uncertainty, the unknown, than to just kind of go through the motions and just kind of go through the flow and kind of see what is happening in the life of other people. Now, how do we do that? How do we actually embrace what God is all about in our lives? Not just kind of go through college and try and find a good job and try and develop uh, wealth and protection and security. The first thing I wish all for all of our graduates and for all of us is I wish they would consume the fire of passion to find their dreams, and not just go for the least common denominator, which is often what pays the most. What sets your heart on fire? 
What, what lightens you? What is it that you are uniquely gifted and talented to do? What is it that really awakens you and says, I love doing this, than to give your whole life to it? There's nothing sadder than people that have lived their whole life that look back and say, this is what I could have been, what I should have been, what I wanted to truly do. Warren Buffett, who is one of the, uh, right, one of the richest men who loves to invest, but it's interesting about Warren Buffett in an interview once, he said he doesn't, he doesn't really care about the money. It's not about developing more. It's almost now a game to him. He just loves the idea of wrestling with business. But he reminds us that sometimes chains of habit are often too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. The point is to set up for yourself habits that you know are the right ones, that will create for you that passion, that God has something greater, that your life is not just a series of classes that you got to go to. It's not about obtaining degrees and going through that rhythm and that cycle, but it's about discovering who you really are, how your talents and how your passions are woven together to find something greater. Khalil Gibran, who is a wonderful poet that I've often read, says, desire is half of life, but indifference is half of death. To desire something greater than yourself, to have that passion. And that's what Pentecost is really all about. All of a sudden, all of these disciples that were fearful of, of Rome, of Judaism, of the establishment, were now world changers. All of a sudden, because of this Pentecost moment, they went out and they changed the world. And the question for us is, how will we go out and change the world? How will we use the blessings that we have already been given, your parents, this environment that you live in, this this bubble of peace that we call mineral wells? How will we take all of these blessings and let it go into the world and change the world? What is our passion? Or do we just kind of go through the motions? One of the great uh, ironies of our time is we have all this information available to us. We just don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to use it to make life better. And so we just are on this perpetual treadmill trying to figure out what will come next. We look for the next big thing without enjoying the the passions of where we are today. So here's my challenge to you. Decide now who you are and then live into it. In the quietness of your own thoughts and your own mind, think through, who am I? Not who everybody else says that you are, or what will seem as successful, but who am I? I've often used this this quote right by Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist. He said, the world's going to ask you just once who you are. And if you don't know, then it will tell you who you are. We call that clever marketing trying to market to your weakest moments, your vulnerabilities, your fears, and your anxieties. So here's what I challenge you on this Pentecost Sunday. Decide now who you are and then live into that passion. The second thing that often happens is the fire of our choices. I love this quote by uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon. He once said, you know, if you lie down with dogs, you're going to wake up with fleas. The idea being that you become like the people that you're around. As a matter of fact, uh, Richard Rohr once said that you will become the average of the five people that you hang around with. So look at your friends, the people that you hang around with, the people that you surround yourself with. Think about who you hang around with. The, the, maybe when you go to college and you hang around at church, do you go to church? Do you hang around with people with values that are like yours? Or do you try and fit into another group? You become like the people that you hang around with. So my challenge to you is to simply hang around with people that you admire for their conversation is different. They believe things differently. They see life differently. They accept the challenges as well as the opportunities. And for all of us, who do we hang around with? Who do we emulate? Who do we look for, for guidance and for hope. And finally, and this is perhaps the most significant, I I offer you the, the fire of crisis. 
when you, go, when you leave and you go off to school or you go to a job or whatever, you will inevitably face a crisis. I mean, think about it to some extent. Oftentimes, many of our kids get involved in sports. And, and what are sports? Opportunities for us to challenge ourselves, to perhaps practice and to rise above, to challenge ourselves. I often wanted to ask, would it be better for, for, uh, for teams to practice against the weakest teams in, in the area or the strongest ones? Which ones make you better? Well, oftentimes it's the strongest ones, right? They, they elevate you. They, they rise your game. And I think God understands that. And oftentimes it is our crises that draw the best out of us. Sometimes it's the tests. It's the study sessions. It's the desire to say, which of these two best, situ- best fits your personality? To follow the crowd or to rise up and to be something more? Sometimes the seeds of faith are always within us, but it takes a crisis to nourish and encourage their growth. It is in a crisis that we revealed who we really are and what we can truly become. Why do crisis important for all of us, for all of us that are sitting out there? Because there's more to you than you know. There's more going on in your heart than you realize. There's more that has to be welling up and you have to discover it for yourself. And so in Pentecost, that come on a regular basis to all of us, God is awakening us to what we could truly be if you would find the crisis in your life, if you would accept the challenge and that you would feel and find the passion for a different kind of life. We call that a Pentecost experience. For all of us as a church, we have to awaken to what God is inviting us to be. As the, as the tongues of fire settled on the disciples, they felt that God was calling them to change the world. Can you imagine how weird that would have seemed in a small upper room in Jerusalem, in a small corner of the Middle East? These people decided they needed to change the world. And they did. And I can't help but wonder if God is inviting you to change your life or whether you have grown cold or whether you've forgotten what God has invited you to do, when was the last time you felt that spirit resting upon you? As we celebrate not only Pentecost, but Graduate Sunday, I see a parallel where God is inviting our students and us to do a new thing, and God is inviting you to awaken to that possibility. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for all of our graduates, for their parents, their grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, and neighbors that have come to celebrate this milestone, but also that sees the challenges ahead and is excited for what growth and the potential for each and every every one to grow into your grace. So, Father, bless them and us as we accept this challenge and we grow in new, exciting ways. This we ask in Jesus' name.